Tonight's online event is the third and the last of the year of our series, Extraordinary Women Speaker Series. Tonight's session is Extraordinary Women in Sports, and I'm Mona Sorensen, and I'm your host tonight with two incredible guests, which are Pauline Mensah, Pauline, wave, and Kaya Parnaby. Where are you, Kaya? I see you. And before we start, though, I'd just like to proceed to the acknowledgement of country. So in the spirit of reconciliation, the So Optimist, Randwick and Eason suburbs acknowledges the traditional custodians of country throughout Australia and their connection to land, sea and community. We pay our respect to their elders past and present and extend that respect to all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples today. Right, tonight's guests of honor are two incredibly talented top athletes. First of all, we've got world surfing champion, Pauline Mensah, and we've got softball multiple world championship medalist and Olympian, Kaya Parnaby. First of all, I'd like to thank you from the bottom of my heart for being here tonight. It's this opportunity to be talking to you tonight and sharing your story is quite incredible for me. None of us knew each other a month ago. I myself, for instance, I never knew about surfing or any surf community anywhere I lived in the world. When I was a young girl, I was kicking a football around quite a lot, come from Denmark. And I only started surfing two years ago, already over 50. And uh, Kaya, that's how I got to know your partner, Michelle, when you were away in Japan, participating in the Tokyo Olympics. With my group of older surfy chicks, and I have to stress that I am by far one of the oldest, um, we went to Randwick to see the movie um, Girls Can't Surf, which was a groundbreaking movie telling the story of female surfing over four decades. It was quite a revelation. And I think that every single person who was in the cinema, we lived the story. We laughed and we cried and we came out blown away. Actually, I have goosebumps right now by you and your story, Pauline. So when I reached out to both of you, with you not knowing me from Adam, and you both said yes without batting an eyelid, I was just blown away by your generosity. And I'm looking forward to you telling your stories and sharing them with the community here. And at this stage, I had actually prepared a quite long introduction with your incredible feats and the long list of medals, et cetera. But I think it's just so much more interesting if we jump right into it and you make the introduction of yourself, yourself and so maybe we can start with Pauline. Who are you? Where are you from? Where did you grow up? Where are you right now? Career highlights, hurdles, and how did it start? How quickly do you realize you may have a proper knack for your sport and you may want to pursue this? So I grew up in Bondi Beach and I had three brothers and, and my mum and we were always going to the beach every day. And I wanted to surf, but I came from a poor family and so my mum said, if you want to get a surfboard, you're going to have to save up and get it yourself. And um, lucky for me, my brother broke his cool light in, in half and I ended up starting on half a surfboard. Yeah. And um, that was at Bronte Beach. And yeah. then I loved it so much. I ended up collecting cans and um, baking cakes and whatever I could to get some money to get a surfboard. And then I went and bought my first cool light board and started at Bondi because Bondi had a few few more better waves from my level than um, trying to surf on a reef at, at Bronte. And um, the first event I went in was at Bondi Beach against boys, and that was actually a cool light contest. And um, a cool light's a foam surfboard. And interestingly enough, I got to the final and everybody said I should have won the final, but because it was a boys' event and I'd entered it, as a woman, they didn't want this, you know, young young girl winning the boys' event. So I got second. But I That's got incredible. Few, yeah, I got quite a few prizes, and um, <clears throat> that was the first time I ever got anything free. So I was like, oh my god, you surf and you get free stuff. And so you know, I just really enjoyed it, and I was pretty much hooked after that going in that event. And then there was another, um, an older lady surfer called Kathy Anderson. And she really pushed me to start competing. And um, she would take me to some of the events 
And then there was a local surf shop owner called Victor Ford, and they owned him and his brothers owned the surf shops in Bondi Beach and Bondi Junction. And um, one of them just said, you know, like you could really be a great professional surfer or whatever. And I'm just like, I just want to buy my first fiberglass surfboard. And I, <laughs> you've got one in here, but it's forty dollars, and I've only got twenty dollars. And he's like, how about I sponsor you? And um, with that sponsorship, he also knew I had quite bad arthritis as a kid. And so his sponsorship was um, also helping pay for naturopaths and teaching me to eat right. And so I really had a, a great um, positive role model with him and, and Kathy Anderson, who knew quite a lot about competing. And then I did really well, made it to the Australian team and then went on to win the world amateur title in 1988. And then I decided to turn professional straight after that. And by 1993, I won the world professional title. Quite a feat. I mean, you've been touring for many years, over 20 years. And uh, for all of the years of competing, I mean, I looked at your scoreboard. You, you are all of these years, amongst the seven best servers in the world. And, and how many times were you number two? It's unbelievable. It's incredible. Yeah, I'm still one of the, within the top, you know, probably eight or 10 surfers of being the most winningest surfer in, in my career. And um, which was kind of, you know, there's a positive in every negative. I wasn't supported and wasn't sponsored, but I think because of that, it drove me to win. And I won so many events because I wasn't supported. So, um, you know, it was a negative thing that people not looking after me, but it turned out to be something something great in the end. Wow, so girls do it for themselves, basically. Totally. Oh, that's an amazing story. Well, when we watched your, the movie, we saw that you have a lot of resilience for sure. And you sort of uh, had to be hustling through it all and uh, selling things and yeah. It's a great yeah, story to tell. Was... I did get been known, hard to go through. Yeah, I did get known for being a um, wheeler and dealer because I had to. So I'd do things like buy, you know, tons of clothes and just sell them cheap in Europe. Or I got this really cool fancy bike and um, paid two hundred dollars for it in America and sold it for two thousand in France. Yeah. And so I just did <laughs> things like that all the time to survive. <laughs> That's a pretty good deal. Now, Kaya. I'm going to go over to you now. Uh, how much hustling have you had to do? <laughs> do I have to go now? Like, I'm out here. I don't think I can go after Pauline. That's incredible just hearing everything. Holy wow. I um, haven't had to do some hustling in my life, but I've had to fork out a lot of money. Um, so I grew up on Sydney's northern beaches. I started playing softball when I was 10 or 11. Um, my PE teacher lined us up on the line at Newport Primary and just had us throw and catch and basically just went, yep, 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 you guys can come play um, if you wanted to play down at the local Manly Comp down at Brookvale. And that was basically my first introduction to softball. Um, it wasn't until I was probably 12 that I realised pitching was my thing. I attended a pitching clinic that my sister actually was at and um, funnily enough, the lady running it was a former student of my mum's at Davidson High School. So, um, yeah, and Sharon kind of had come up and said to my mum, like, I think your daughter could be something. She's got the right build. I was this little chunky, chunky thing. Um, I think she's got the right build and I think she has the right athleticism to be a pitcher. And I was like, I'm just this short, chunky girl from Newport, like, do you really? And she kind of had this, I think it was like a six year plan at that stage. And it was like by 2007, um, you're going to be on the junior Australian team and you'll be going to um, the junior world championship. And she led me right through it. I thought she was going to be my pitching coach at that time, um, but she got overlooked, which was really unlucky, but I was there and I won a bronze medal at um, the junior world championships in, in 2007. And in 2008, I got my first gig into the senior Australian team, 
or senior, uh, senior Australian squad, sorry, and um, helped them in their lead up to Beijing. I was still only 17 years old at the time. So just a little girl. And um, yeah, that was really the first time that I realized, hey, I could actually do this for a living. This could be what I do. And in 2008, it was at a national tournament in Tasmania where I got approached to go to college in Hawaii. And they have a massive program over there for athletics and for softball. And the coach basically walked up to me and said, have you ever thought about um, coming to America for college? And my mum was like, oh, yeah, Hawaii, absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> she basically had said to me, like, you just play softball and I'll sit on the beach and drink margaritas for you. <laughs> you still work. And I was like, okay, that's fine by me. So, um, yeah, signed my letter of intent to go to Hawaii and that was, yeah, as I said, just the start of my career. Everything rolled on from then. I've been to five world championships now. I've medaled at two of them. Um, just participated in the Tokyo Olympic Games this past summer, which was a huge stepping stone in itself just to be able to get there. And play professionally in Japan now after I graduated from the University of Hawaii back in 2013. So I've been in Japan for eight years now. Um, very fortunate to play professionally and have that as my full-time job. Never thought in my wildest dreams that that would be the case and didn't ever think that softball was going to make a living for me. So I'm very thankful for the opportunities that I've been given in my career. And here I am today speaking to you guys and still doing what I love. That's an amazing story. I mean, uh, so, so, you left, uh, so you left the country at 17, 18? 18. I, yeah, and so, but I, I, re I reckon your mum couldn't stay with you on the beach all that time, right? So, uh, I mean, she would have loved to, but she did. She did visit once a year every four, every year I was there for the four years. It must be also character building to be so far away from home, and, and probably not being able to get home really quickly or a lot of times. Yeah, the first I remember the first. First week I was in Hawaii, I was this little naive teenager and it had come for my mum and my sister to leave. And I remember just like bursting into tears. I was just this, I was just like, oh my God, I'm fine. Like I'm on my own. I'm in a foreign country and I'm on my own for the first time. And I was very fortunate to have another Australian with me. And she just basically took me in and was like, you'll be fine. <laughs> and I just remember like, I just like clung onto her for like the first week. I just didn't want to leave because I just needed that Australian accent. Like I was in this foreign country with all these people I've literally met the day before or the week before. And yeah, it was, it was out, it was a really crazy time in my life, but I look back on it now and I wish I could go back. Like that's over 12 years ago now. And I'm like, how is that possible? Like, yeah. I feel like it was only yesterday that I was doing it. Time flies. Now, as you can hear, I'm not Australian, but I always loved Australian accents Pauline, when you were away, and Kaya, when you were away in the US, how, how, how does that accent get through? I, I reckon, I mean, my experience is that everybody loves Australians. Oh, totally. I remember people just always never ending, can I have a glass of water? <laughs> we say water, water. <laughs> but um, yeah, my first trip away was Hawaii as well. And um, I just loved it. Like I loved, cause I was, grew up with three brothers, two sets of twins. I couldn't wait to get away and, and be amongst different people. <laughs> and, um, but I was with quite a few other boy surfers. I was in Hawaii with, um, there, there was the world amateur team. So we'd all been to Puerto Rico together already and then traveled over there. And then my first year on tour, California was my first stop. And I was supposed to be traveling with another professional surfer and she just, called me up the day before and said she can't make it. And, um, lucky for me back then, everyone always helped each other out. And um, she called Alyssa Swartstein and she put me up for a couple of days. And then Pam Burrard said she'll put me up. So uh, it all worked out well. Yeah, it must be hard though to be away from your family. I mean, I hear what you're saying. I've got two older brothers and, I, and a, a little sister. So I mean, any chance to go away to see other people was always welcomed by me. But Kaya, you've lived abroad for so many years. I mean, it must be hard to be away from your family all the time and, 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 and your partner. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> As she sits right here. Um, 
No, it is. I think it took a lot of adjusting and really growing into myself and becoming independent. Uh, growing up, I was very much a dependent oldest child um, on my family, just taking direction and following people. But it, yeah, it made me become independent and I think sometimes too independent because I, Michelle can attest to this, sometimes I am a little distant at times because I'm so independent. I can forget to call, I could forget to text, I can do all those things because I'm so used to being by myself. So um, I did the Hawaii stint and then my poor family like lost me again because I moved to Queensland for seven years. So I've only just recently come back to Sydney and I think they're very grateful that I'm now only an hour drive instead of an hour flight. Um, but yeah, it, it caused me to be independent very quickly. <laughs> so the second question was, was there any key events or people who influenced or inspired your decision to become a professional? Or did you look for a mentor? Was it difficult to find a mentor? I think we touched on that, Pauline, you touched on, 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 on uh, was it Katie Addison? Kathy Anderson, yeah. But um, I was really lucky to find Victor Ford and I remember him always talking to me about my style and um, he used to get me to work on my style a lot, which I really thank him for because my later years, I think I surfed with a lot more, um, like my style was useful to my, my manoeuvres. You know, a lot of women tend to surf. I mean, it's changed now, but back then a lot of them were surfing quite dainty and I wanted to surf with more power. And so he taught me how to do that. And then as I got older, I ended up um, coming up to Byron Bay and had a coach called Steve Foreman, who I was with for over 10 years while I was on tour. And he was fantastic for um, just, just different stuff. Like he was a very different coach to Victor Ford, but um, yeah, I, I, I think I won the world title definitely because of him, like wow. his insight and, also his encouragement because, um, you know, he saw me go through all those times where I was so discriminated against. He even was talking to one of the companies, you know, it was in the movie Girls Can't Surf about um, them saying I didn't have the look that they wanted. Well, it was that company that talked to him about it and said, oh, off record, she doesn't have the look that we want. And... Um, so he would always still encourage me, even though seeing stuff like that. And there'd be heats where I'd lose, it'd be so close. And he'd just be like, don't worry about it. You just got to win by a lot. You know, you can't just make, you got to make it so obvious that you've won the heat. And so he was great as a mentor as well. So I'm lucky too that I probably wouldn't have had any of that if I had to pay anyone. So all these people that um, were coaching me through my career or did it, um, you know, as vol volunteering. So that was really awesome of them. Wow, what a story of love. Mm, Amazing. Totally. Yeah. Kaya? I mean, I agree with Pauline about the whole, they do it for love. Um, I was very lucky with my very first pitching coach who led me through many, many, many years that I still look up to now that she did it out of passion and love for softball and for the potential she saw in me. And I still, she lives in America now and I, any, when I'm there, I go to her facility and I get like, I, you know, I help out or I'll do, I'll do things for her, I'll sign jerseys for her because she's so proud of, I guess she produced, she produced me. She was the reason I became a pitcher and she just has so much, you see it in her all the time. Like she's proud that she was able to do that. And then she let me go with her little wings and off I went into the big world by myself. But she's still someone today that I thank and that I'm very thankful for, um, for having her in my life back when I was this little chubby 12-year-old. Um, but there has been so many other people over my career that I'm so thankful for that have helped me become the athlete I am. And it's not through them coaching, but it's through them leading the way um, for female softballers to become oh, would, you, would you like anything else like I think, I think um, there's so many, I'm very fortunate that in the job I'm in, I'm not the first Australian pitcher to go to this company. Uh, there's many people before me and they led the way for us. Uh, some of them are four-time Olympians. Some of them have just play, played for Australia. Like 
each have their own individual story, but I'm very grateful, um, especially for Tanya Harding and Mel Roach for leading the way uh, for, for me in Japan and to give me the opportunity. And then a lady by the name of Joyce Lester, who was, a, she captained Australia in Atlanta and she captained Australia in Sydney and she was just an incredible softballer in, a, in herself. And she was the very first um, Australian to get signed by my company way back in the day. And she led the path for every contract negotiation we've had, the ability to take weeks off during the season to come home and see our family. Uh, we're very fortunate we have that and no other foreigner in Japan has that. So it's little things like that that have led the way um, for things that I have in my life now that I'm very grateful for and I wouldn't have without the passionate women that have come before me. That's excellent. Now, both of you are having long careers. Um, I just wanted to ask you a question of, on pressure. How do you cope with that pressure? Because going strong staying strong and keeping winning, it's, it's hardcore. Your, your physical career is, has been long. Uh, how do you cope with that kind of pressure? I mean, physical form, mental health, pressure from the media, from the team, pressure from yourself. Is there enough support in your individual sports environments? Kaya? Um, yeah, I'll go. Um... Yes and no. I think I handle pressure a lot differently to a lot of people. I'm very calm. Um, I don't show. I don't show worry. I don't show that I'm nervous at all. So I um I tend to rely a lot on breathing techniques and just really being in the moment and not really thinking about what's going on on the outside. Like, and I think it took me a long time to realize that. And it probably I used I've always handled pressure amazing. Like that's just been what I do. That's why. I've, why my coaches love me because they can just put me out there and no one's going to know if I'm, you know, really angsty that day or I'm anxious or I'm nervous. Like I was just, I'll have a straight face. And I think it took until Tokyo this year to really realize that I have a lot of capabilities with inside myself to lean on and a lot of external um, people to lean on as well to help me with that pressure. And it took me a while to start leaning on those people, but July came this year and I actually had to, I had to speak about my emotions. And there has been times where I didn't think a sports psych was going to be a good idea. Like I was, I was always against that. And then I started going to a sports psych through COVID last year and I loved it. I could say how I felt. I was in a space, a safe environment and, um, it just allowed me to get everything off my chest if I was feeling anxious or I was nervous. And she gave me techniques as to how to deal with those pressures. So I feel very fortunate that I had the access to sports, a sports psychologist. And I just wish I'd had it earlier in my career. Um, it probably would have helped me a lot more. Pauline? Yeah, um, I just seem to do pretty well under pressure. Like most times I would have like no money and I'm like righto you need to win the next event because if you don't win the next event you're off the tour and so um under pressure I did really well I'd end up winning um I think my biggest struggle for me was not the pressure it was um probably my arthritis so dealing with you know waking up in the morning and you can't even move your elbows or your ankles and or turn your neck and you're meant to surf as a top athlete it was quite scary and um, intimidating. So I'd spend all my time getting up early in the morning, have a hot shower, try and get a massage, go for a walk, you know, just, just to be normal. And um, I guess the times it didn't happen too, too often, but the times I did feel pressure or nervous was I noticed that I just like, um, just wasn't breathing properly. So it's a lot of time you're just holding your breath. <laughs> so most times you can get rid of that just by just doing breathing techniques for sure. Yeah, I guess also, I mean, I come from a generation where it's basically suck it up, you know, suck it up. <laughs> if something happens to you, well, just have to move on. I think it's I, great that there's sports psychologists now because, oh, yeah. you know, there might have been when I was on tour, but I never thought about seeing one. But I think it's great because... Um, you know, a lot of people do get worked up and feel this pressure and, um, 
you know, I guess media is different now too. They've got a lot of, you know, with Instagram and um, just constant media in front of your face all the time. Yeah. You've got to learn to swallow, you know, I think that's just as hard as almost the pressure of sport is learning to swallow everything that everyone's saying and um, having someone to talk to and have it out is a great idea. I guess on that front, maybe we are seeing an improvement. We saw during the Olympics that uh, Simone Biles was capable of and not afraid of saying, listen, it's just too much for me. And uh, I think that was maybe also an eye opener for uh, for for a lot of, of people because in the past you'd never get to see that there was a there's always the shield of you are perfect you are performing if you're failing oh too bad for you but being able to say that and be able to 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 express it publicly i think that's that must be something that is really a relief actually mm. i think it's very um i think it was very brave of her to do it but i think it takes someone like her with the profile that she has to allow other people not to be scared to do it because yeah. she has the she has the profile and she has the voice that a lot of other people don't feel like they have. So for her to actually do that, uh, like as a, as another athlete, like watching her do that as well, like it was incredible just for her to be able to go. You know what? Like I could do this and I could still win, but I'm not in the right headspace. I can't do it. And yeah, I think it took a lot for her to do that. That's very brave indeed. Yeah. Now, ladies, and if all of that wasn't hard enough with the training, the competition, and sometimes sickness, um, it's hard enough to be a, a woman in a male dominant sport. Uh, you're both the best in the world in your individual sports. You're from two different age groups. What I'm trying to figure out is has there been a change uh, over time? Uh, for people to be able to just be their best sporting selves and still just being able to say, listen, yes, I am in a same-sex relationship and so what? It's none of your business. Um, we've seen recently a couple of people come, come out, which is something I never saw when I was younger. Um, Pauline, when you were uh, at top level, what was it like for you, the support or non-support? Where are we going um, here? It was really difficult because, you know, I was gay while I was on tour and, and even when I won the world title, I was gay at that time. And it was at a time that it was actually dangerous to be yourself because um, gay people were getting murdered. So, yes. um, you know, I, I knew a guy that lived up the street that all of a sudden disappeared and many years later I found out that he was one of the people that was murdered at Bondi. And so you know, I had this great fear and I also saw it was such a male dominated sport and they just didn't want the women to have anything. And at the time of my peak, there was a recession. So the guys were really like not wanting the women to get anything. And um, yeah, it was just such a struggle. Like it was just unbelievable for them. You know, they, they just wanted us off the tour. They didn't even <laughs> want us there. So here we are not only just fighting to catch waves and be in the same kind of conditions as them, we're just fighting to even be there. So basically everything was a struggle and I didn't see, you know, there was a bit of change, but it happened really slowly. And then one day I was listening to the radio and I heard them announce that women surfers are getting equal prize money. And I seriously absolutely started bawling my eyes out with happiness that I just couldn't believe that in my lifetime that that happened and that it it's changing for the better. And, um, you know, I think in the last three or four years, a lot of changes happen. And, you know, you're seeing dads taking all their girls surfing and just this real nice family thing about it where it wasn't just, you know, it was always for the boys and now it's a real family event. And now because there's equal prize money, they're pushing these young girls and these young girls are doing amazing maneuvers the same as the boys yeah and I kind of every time I see them doing these crazy big aerial 360s I like to say to all those guys the girls will never surf as good as the guys yeah we'll watch them <laughs> now so I just love seeing that I just love that it's something that we've said for a long time if you 
put money into the women, it'll happen. And they never believed us. And now look what's happening. Actually, that's the next question. Equal play, equal pay. But I just wanted to ask Kaya, how about you? You live in Japan, which is quite a conservative country. Yeah. What's your, what's the support for you? Um, in Japan, not much in terms of um, my relationship and how I identify. Uh, they are very backwards still in, um, I guess, backwards, you know, like they're not. Not there yet. Yeah, they're not, they're not, yeah, that uh, yet. They are in, um, in Shibuya, they are. They allow same-sex marriages, but that's just one little part of Tokyo. Like it's not even Tokyo itself. It's just one little part. Um, so it's very different over there. My team obviously know who Michelle is and um, know about me and everything, and they're very supportive. A lot of my teammates um, are gay, but they'll never tell their family. It's no. very secretive. Uh, it's all on the hush hush, and they'll probably end up marrying a man when they finish softball because that's just what they do. Um, if they're gay, they end up transitioning because that's more acceptable than it is to be gay. So I've got a lot. I've got well, I've got a couple now, and. I've had former teammates that have transitioned because they felt a lot more comfortable with who they were then um, and being able to be accepted by their family. But in terms of softball itself, I think it's come a long way in just having an identity. We always got grouped with baseball and we were always the female equivalent of baseball, but we're a completely different sport. Yeah. And I think over time, people have started to realize that and we've grown in like grown in ourselves and we're not we don't have a male dominated side of softball we are the dominant side but we do have baseball which is such a huge sport in itself um, that kind of dominates us and puts us in a category and I mean baseball is the reason why we got taken out of the games after 2008 so they did yeah. lump us together and that is why, yeah, I think for females to come a long way in softball, we've still got a long way to go. But I think the movement that's going with females sports and getting recognised and getting paid correctly, just getting the recognition that females deserve, softball has a long way to go, but I can see it following in the footsteps of all these other amazing sports that are being the pioneers for women in sport. So I really hope that I can look back when my career is long gone and hopefully realize that I've paved a way for um, female softballers to be able to do it professionally or just be able to, you know, go away to a national tournament and not spend $3,000 because we have no funding. So exactly. uh, to be able to represent the country and not pay for it, like to, for softballers, that would be amazing. Yeah, I think it was, um, well, recently uh, we talked about pressure from the media, that the media is very much in international sports people's faces. Uh, I guess this time social media was a good catalyzer for the young surfers. I think it was 2018 when uh, these two youngsters were competing and they won a competition and you saw the girl with a check of $4,000 and the boys $8,000 and everybody started shouting on social media. I said, what the heck? I think that was just good, a good timing that people responded because that's been like that for so long. Yeah. It happened that it just went viral at the right time. Yeah. And also now I understand better the baseball and the softball analogy because I was sort of reading up on payment and I saw that the best female pitcher in the world would take it home around 200,000 US dollars a year but her male counterpart would take 25 times that a year and that's quite mind-blowing. Like we look at we look at who you're speaking about now and I think gosh Monica Abbott she she earns good money over in Japan like she earns like way above anyone else. But then if you compare her to the likes of, I don't know, a pitcher in the major league and you're like, okay, she's earning one twentieth of what he's making and he plays <laughs> half the time of what she does. And she puts in so much more hard work and dedication. And she's probably paid a lot more out of her pocket over the years to play the sport and the recognition that she gets, even in America, who, you know, they have their own professional league over there. Like she just, yeah. 
they, it will come one day for a softball, but we just, I, I'm just loving watching all the, the, every other sport moving in the right direction. It's just nice to see. And hopefully one day we can just be on the little, little tail end of it and jump on with it. Yeah, hopefully the government will make a ruling that it has to be equal play, equal pay. Um, yeah, well, they're doing the, um, they had the, the petition out to go to the New South Wales government about it. I signed it. I thought it was a really good initiative. Yeah, Lucy Small did that because yeah. after she spoke out and yeah. uh, people were a little bit astonished. Said, Come on, you, we just gave you some, threw some money at you and now you're complaining about it. But most people, I think 95% of people who heard that said, yes, we agree. And she's now become a spokeswoman for equal play, equal pay, which I think is amazing. Yeah, yeah she's after, oh, sorry, Pauline. <laughs> Paul? Sorry, I was just gonna say, after after we went last week to watch, um, what was what she, she said? Says. Yeah, after we went last week to watch, I went and thanked her for like speaking out and being the voice that we all needed because it only takes one person to speak out and to, for it to catch on and what she's doing and the petition she started and hopefully the movement that she's creating is going to go in the right way for at least the New South Wales government um, to take some action and to, to get that equal pay. Pauline? Yeah, I was saying the same thing. I've been watching her and, and, um, it's just amazing what she's done and you just need a few people like that to make such big changes and if we can all get on board and, and support her it's um, you know I can see it happening like I said it's changed quite a lot in the last few years and, and this never ending push I feel is really awesome I mean uh, Pauline we, we know that you've had, you had a really hard time I mean there, there was no big money being thrown around uh, and you talked about also being discriminated against by the industry, by the blokes, and maybe the girls were not actually hanging together and being solidary. Um, there's a question from um, the audience asking, so it's to, to both of you, what did you find was the hardest obstacle in your journey to achieve the outcomes in your career? Uh, it was definitely not having much money. You know, here I am concentrating on where I can sleep for the night instead of eating well and looking after my health. So yeah, definitely the biggest obstacle is the lack of support. Um, biggest obstacle. Um, I think my biggest obstacle came very early in my career. Um, literally when I was at the ripe old age of 11, I missed out like back then, like I was like all in, like this is all I wanted to do. And I missed out on, on just like, you know, a school team, like on the school Sydney North team. And I was heartbroken and I really wanted to do it. And my mom said to me, you know, you've got, you've got a few options here. Um, and I decided I didn't want to go to an all girls private school as well. And she's like, well, that's, you've got two options here. You either repeat grade six or you go to this all girls private school. And I was like, I'm repeating grade six. That was probably my biggest obstacle that I've, well, one that pops to my head that I've faced because I watched all my friends go off to high school. I repeated grade six, but I made that PWSA state team the next year. And I honestly think if I had never made that state team or if I had never been successful, because I was feeling really down about where my, like where, what I was going to do. Like I was too short to play netball. I was too short and chunky to play netball. Um, I wasn't going to get anywhere in surf life saving or swimming. Like I just didn't feel like I had direction in my life. And I know I was very young, but I think if I had not done that, I wouldn't have played softball. Like I would have been on a completely different path where I am today. So I think if I didn't have that, uh, it may seem so stupid because I was 11 years old, but yeah, I think that was one of the ones that sticks out to me that was just like a hurdle that I had to overcome. And it got me, well, it helped me get on the path as to where I was going to today. So that's one of mine that I can think of. Definitely a, a tale of, of dedication and probably also character, right? Yes. I, I bet your mom thought, today. <laughs> I bet your mom thought, what is that <laughs> thing that came out of me? <laughs> <laughs> now, I have a question uh, which is was supposed to be the last question but it's going to be the second last 
now with your incredible achievements. I mean, Pauline, you are retired, um, but and Kaya, you're still very much active, but with all of this experience, because you've both come a really long way, which words of wisdom would you have for young women and girls and parents, uh, for the girls who are embarking on a professional sports journey that eventually will take you around the world? Um, what I see is changing now is they're getting a little bit too uh, marketed at a young age. So I think hold back and enjoy surfing and having fun while you're younger you know yeah train hard and everything but um don't be so competitive so young because I can see that a lot of these kids are probably going to get burnout by the time they're um ready to travel and for me just some my own experience I would say to be yourself don't try and you know again with Instagram it's you got all these kids sort of like doing modeling stuff and I feel like that's not every child you know some of them might like it but other ones are just feeling pressured because everyone else is doing it so yeah that would be my my advice is to be yourself oh that's a brilliant advice Kaya mine was going to be very similar to that because I was going to go along the lines of to have fun because you don't do it because you don't start doing it because you hated it you, you started it because you had fun doing it and I think a lot of people get lost in it when they find their talent that they get lost in the why they started and I think it's very important to go back to your roots and remember why you did start and how much fun you had doing it and to continue that through your career because that's what creates longevity because you enjoy going out to train you enjoy being in the surf you enjoy being on a softball field you enjoy I don't know just being around friends and family and, and doing that stuff. So my advice to guess young kids wanting to start out the professional career is like what Pauline said, have fun and be yourself because you don't get far when you're trying to fake it because it'll always come through in the end. Yeah. Like, like then there's a question from Satomi saying, uh, so talking about enough support, what would you suggest to get more support for on how to find more support this is quite a wide, wide question. Mm. I feel like try, like in finding support, you've got to really feel comfortable in reaching out to the wider community and not being afraid to ask the person next to you, um, like if what they do, like just, you know, reaching out, hearing other people's stories. And, and, and I guess it's different in softball because we're very much, I go, oh, no, surfing's a team too. Like, you know, you're a team, you're an individual within a team and you've got your teammates to lean on. You've got your people there that you lean on. And I think it's very important to use the resources you have around you and yeah. to see what they might have to offer you. Totally, like network more. Yeah. Yeah, like, I don't know, say Michelle has, like, say I'm struggling with, I don't know, mentally in the circle or something and I reach out to Michelle I'm like hey like I'm really struggling with this she might have good technique that can help me even though she doesn't play softball she might have a good technique that might help me or she might have a contact that she can be like hey this person's really good at this I suggest you reach out to them but yeah I think networking is a massive thing these days very good now my last question was going to be a trick one. Having said that, I just want to say to the girls, because it's mostly girls, I haven't seen any boys, Terry. Um, if you have any questions, please shoot them off now, because my next question is going to be the last one. Um, it's a trick question. So Pauline, what next? I mean, I, I watched the podcast recently uh, that you were on. Uh, it was called Walk With Me. And um, you talked about being recognized finally, you know, and uh, you talked about becoming an advocate for girls surfing. How do you, what is your next step? I know that you have a job, you know, because surfing didn't pay the rent and the rest of your life. You have a job, you live in Byron Bay and you might not be able to surf all the time, but what's the next step for you? Um, so it's quite funny since the movie, I've had a few opportunities come up. Uh, I've got sponsored by a couple of people. And um, one of them's the Surfboard Warehouse. And 
I'm making my own surfboards now. So it's still not quite launched yet. We're about to launch it. But um, people have always asked me like, oh, what sort of board should I ride? And, um, you know, for years and years and years, I kept seeing everyone riding, just trying to ride professional surface boards. And I always kept saying you need to ride fatter and wider boards. So I've come up with a design of a board that is good for everyone. So even if you're a good surfer, you'll like it because it's got quite a bit of flotation. And then um, just people who are learning will have fun on it. And so it's kind of weird at, you know, 52 to be finally sponsored and, and having support now. But it's a nice thing too to see that, um, you know, because I am the perfect person being gay and, you know what I mean, that doing um, trying to include everybody now it's nice to be recognised for being different, whereas before it was like, well, you're different, we don't want to touch you, whereas now, um, yeah, it's just great support. That's amazing. Oh, my God. Okay, I, I know that all the surfer girls who are listening to this, they're all going to go, ah, hold back on the next board because we're going to wait for yours. <laughs> well, the, the cute thing is, too, I had a competition to name the board. And it was a little 14-year-old girl that came up with the equaliser because she said you always tried to equalise women surfing and she feels that she, if because that was a competition, you win a board, and she's like, oh, if I get one of these, I feel like I'll have magic powers. Oh. That's a really that sweet story. That is a great story. I love it. Okay, so we will be surfing on your boards pretty soon. That's a great ending. I'm pretty oh. sure you just sold one right here. Yeah. <laughs> that's it sign me up <laughs> how about you Kaya because well you, you're still active and and uh, you're probably going to be going for a long time I mean <laughs> knock on wood I'll but... see if it's a long time or if it's just going to be a good time um <laughs> as for right now I still play professionally in Japan uh, I have world championships next year in the U.S. And I'm currently studying my master's of education. So in the future, I know softball is not a lifelong thing for me um, or will it pay my bills long after I'm finished playing? So I've taken the initiative to study my master's and I'm going to be a HPE teacher. So I really look forward to being able to just teach the younger generation PE um, and just, yeah, being active in the sports community. I'd love to be involved in the high performance side of softball in a way. I'm currently working at the Australian Olympic Committee uh, and it's actually probably a dream job because I get to see what happens on the other side of um, everything that just happened in Tokyo. And it's really cool just to have an insight of that and to see what they do to get us ready to go to these Olympic Games. And I think if I look at it now, like working in high performance, working in all that kind of stuff, it's kind of um, where I'd like to be as well. So currently studying, not giving up playing. And um, yeah, I'd love to give back to the greater sporting community in the long run, not just in softball, but in all women's sport, wherever I can give back. Sounds amazing. I mean, are you sort of preparing or is it too early to say for a certain Olympic Games coming to Australia? I mean, 2032, I'll be 42. Um, <laughs> I don't know how well a pitcher's life lifespan can go. I would love to be on the coaching side. Let's just put it that way. As a 42-year-old giving back to the younger generation of softballers and having, I think what really lacked this year with our softball team at the Olympics was the lack of Olympic experience. We had one player who had been to an Olympic Games and that was it. And none of our coaches had so to be able to have players and coaches that have Olympic experience, I think that will go a long way to just ground the girls and really, you know, get them in the moment and not take, not be, oh my God, we're at a home Olympic Games. I think that's just going to be crazy in itself. So, But couldn't it be for both of you, the Olympic Committee? You both have so much to give. Well, Pauline, if you're keen. <laughs> <laughs> totally. The Olympic, yeah, the Australian Olympic Committee, they're just amazing people and they're always looking for people to give back to, to their sport and with surfing and Olympic sport as well now. Yeah. That's so exciting. I literally, I'm packing at the moment. We've got a massive thing for all the Olympians on the 15th. Sorry, my dog's growling. Um, 
we've got this massive thing on the 15th and I was packing away the patches today and Michelle being the avid surfer she is at the moment, I was packing Sally Fitzgibbon's patch away and Steph Gilmore's and I just took like a little screenshot and sent it to Michelle <laughs> and I was like, look, look, look what I get to do right now. Like it was just so cool because obviously I look up to those girls as well and to be rubbing shoulders with them in the Olympic Village, that was crazy. It's actually funny seeing that, you know, all the Olympic team are all so starstruck on each other. Oh, it's crazy. Like, it's so crazy. Like, you walk past them in the village, you're like, oh, my God, oh, my God, oh, my God. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, we are very jealous, I must say, but um, basically you have just both deserved to be in that club because you work very hard for it. So, yeah, the rest of us will watch it on television. We did enjoy watching the, the surfers. Uh, I enjoyed it thoroughly, for sure, Anna. Not that I will ever be at any level like that. Mm -hmm. But um, on that note, um, there was a question to Kaya actually, why Japan and not Australia or US? Australia doesn't have a professional league. Um, I don't know if we ever will get one up and running. It's not, it's not a big sport over here, which is really unfortunate with especially the way all the other women's sports are going. Um, and I have played stints in the US, but their professional league only runs during their summer months. And the money's in Japan because we're, we're, we're owned by companies like Toyota, Big Camera, Hitachi, Honda. We're owned by all those big companies. Um, and they're currently ranked number one in the world, have won both, um, both last previous two gold medals in the, at the Olympics. So, um, yeah, I really wish we could get something up and running in Australia. I don't see it happening in the near future, but I really, really hope that I can look back sitting on my uh, deck chair when I'm 70 or 80 and, and get to see young softballers play professionally in their home country because leaving your family for months and months and years on end is, is extremely hard. Um, and I'd love to be able to just sit back and watch them all do it in their backyard. And because Australia is such an awesome place to be and their sporting culture here is amazing, I just love for everyone to be able to do it in Australia in the future. I guess that is the closing words of today. Pauline, do you have anything to add? No, just thanks for inviting me. It's been a great opportunity to share my story and or our story and um, you know I always like to share our stories just because if it inspires one person that's awesome and uh, we all need to stick together and help women in general succeed. Absolutely yeah absolutely so Kaya and Pauline thank you so much for having been here tonight thank you for being so generous with your time and sharing your career stories and sharing all these little anecdotes and your experience. I also want to thank everybody who's here tonight um, and remind you that the recording will be made available online once it's been redacted properly. And I will now give the floor to Johanna, who is our president of SOAR Optimist um, Randwick and Eastern Suburbs. The floor is yours. Thank you, Mona. Um, yes, thank you again, uh, Kaya and Pauline. How inspiring. Um, it's been um, a topic I'm not that sporty I must admit however so this one was a really eye-opener and, and and true enjoyment so um, thank you very much again for taking the time and Mona thank you very much for being an amazing host and MC tonight so um, this was as Mona mentioned before our third uh, speaker's night and um, yeah it's been uh, it's been really wonderful so I enjoyed truly enjoyed tonight and I hope everyone else did um, it definitely is lots of food for thought and it's, um, it's very inspiring as well because based on what you're saying, you can see the so much we've all come so far already and so the future just looks so promising and Kaya, you never know, maybe one day you'll be invited to, you know, start up the Australian softball national team who knows I don't think you'll have to wait until you're 70 or 80 to be honest <laughs> so. I, I hope I hope my fingers are crossed <laughs> um so yes I'm I'm the president of so Optimist International um Randwick Eastern Suburbs we are an international organization I'll just give you a little bit of a very quick rundown but um of who we are 
sometimes, <laughs> sadly, we're a bit of the world's best kept secret. Um, we are an international organization. We're actually 100 years old. Um, starting, we started off in the US. And there's lots of different branches um, throughout the world and Australia and Sydney. Um, as you can see behind me, it's the global voice uh, for women. So we are women. Um, tend to be in business or not, but helping out women in need and women and children in need. Um, on an international level, we actually have um, a consultative representation at the UN. So there is quite a bit of power behind the good old optimists. <laughs> um, and um, locally, we, we are involved in our own projects. So for Renwick in Eastern suburbs, we work with the Royal Hospital for Women on um, several projects, which would be little bundles to give away to um, to newborn babies where the mothers may not have had the um, the opportunity or the money um, to, to have a whole, you know, the, the, the hospital bag ready to go. Um, or the same for the mothers where we have um, bundles for vulnerable mothers um, who come to the hospital with not that much, um, as you can see with other mothers loaded with big bags. Um, we also work on a scholarship for rural midwives, where we invite um, rural midwives and, and sponsor them for the annual midwifery conference, and then um, organize a two-week training or exchange program in the Royal Hospital for Women. So they exchange um, ideas and um, networking, really, what we mentioned before, so which is good. And um, the rural midwives can help the city midwives being very resourceful. And the sitting midwives, I suppose, can give some good ideas and tips to the rural ones. Um, then we also work with local um, local primary schools, and it's all about empowering, enabling, and educating young girls um, and boys, and really in, in the early ages as well, just to make sure that, like we said before, we're surfing, you know, that both understand we both can do it. Both uh, girls and boys can equally. Um, do it there and there, there shouldn't be any discrimination at all but um, yeah so there, these are some of the projects we're doing locally um, and we have a fantastic club and again I want to thank my members tonight who've been working really hard behind the scenes getting uh, the speaker series going um, but yeah and again thank uh, Pauline and Kaya uh, for coming along. We'll have a, another topic next year. We'll try to do these speaker events monthly. So um, feel free to join on this. Uh, the topic for next year is still to be um, advised. Um, but yeah, we've got some, some good uh, topics lined up and speakers lined up, I should say. But yeah, well, with that, I think time was, oh, we're spot on. Mona, well done. <laughs> Look at that timing. <laughs> Um, yes, yeah, so if you've got any questions, feel free, feel free to reach out. But um, for tonight, again, how inspiring. Thank you so much, Pauline and Kaya. It's, um, yeah, the future looks bright, I think, in the sporting world, definitely. I hope, Pauline, when you're coming down to Bondi, you let us know because you have a, you have a huge fan club um, in the in the Sophie Chicks of Eastern Suburbs. And uh, it would just be so tough to meet you. And I hope, Kaya, you're going to join. If you're on a break until March, there'll be plenty of time. I'll be there watching you guys, definitely. <laughs> well, no, yeah, we'll Kaya, you enjoy your long break. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Thanks, ladies. Thanks very much. Thank you, everybody. Thank you very much. Have a, Have good, a good evening. evening.